So then, Smokehead, we're back again. I'm loving our chats, and I think everyone out there is loving them as well. Everyone's loving it. Can we, We've just reached a landmark, haven't we? A thousand subscribers in three yeah, I'm, days. That, what is it, in two days, three days? Two, three days, yeah. Yeah, that is amazing. I'm yeah, hoping it everyone. climbs and climbs and climbs and keeps going. Um, it's just nice that we're doing this. I'm enjoying it. Obviously, everyone out there is enjoying it. And the guests we've had on, it's great to speak to those people, isn't it? Really? So, yeah. I think the, the Rob Hughes one in particular would be so interesting. I was just going to say, yeah. What everybody thinks to that, because obviously he doesn't know all the answers, but he's well informed. So let's hope that um, people enjoyed that. Yeah, get a bit of engagement. Comment below, comment on our Facebooks. Just tell us what you think about you know, Rob's views and whether you agree with them or not. But like you say, there's not many people in a better position to talk about it than Rob. So. No, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is why I love podcasts, because the opportunity to sit and you hear sound bites, don't you? And little quotes and little, little bits on Facebook, but to actually have a chat with somebody for 40 minutes, is that you see a different side, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You get all the ins and outs, all the yeah. ins and outs. Yeah. But that brings me on to yeah. what I want to talk about today. Okay. So we'll scrap all the questions, we'll scrap the guests. Because I want to talk to you about your life in fishing, really, okay. and your take on things, especially at the minute as well. Mm -hmm. Because quite a lot of the time, obviously, my story has been told a few times um, on different different platforms about you know how I how I got to what I'm doing now. But I don't think your story has. And I know no. for a fact that you've told me in the past that you get a few people messaging you saying, "Oh, I love what you're doing. How do I get a job in fishing?" And obviously, it's a lot of lot of young anglers' dreams to get a job in fishing, or to be a yeah. sponsored angler, or just be doing something in the in the sport that they love. So, talk to me from the start. Where did it begin? Did you start fishing with your dad? Now, I know a lot of these answers already, but not everyone else does. Did you start fishing with your dad? Did it, was it a local thing? Was it matches? What was it? Where did it begin? I started fishing with my dad. We, like everyone does, we were walking the dog at, at the time around some local gravel pits in Nairs, where I'm from. Um, spotted some of his mates fishing. Said to my dad, I was five years old at the time, said, can I have a go? Of course you can. He bought me some kit from Argos, I remember. It was a Kingfisher set up and it came in a little box, telescopic rod. And we went down the thing, caught a chub first time out. So it was like hooked, went on the river nid. Caught a chub first time out, hooked for life. Literally. I remember the Argos kits. Yeah. Um, uh, to be fair, I used to look through them Argos catalogs, thinking that kit is brilliant. Yeah. And I used to all I used to want that kit. Yeah. Compared to what I was actually given to start fishing by my dad, who was obviously Pack sort of like club, and... club, well, he wasn't at the time. He was a club standard match angler, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was using his old rods, which were fiberglass, really old ancient rods that mm. he'd probably whipped the eyes on a couple of times and <laughs> the handle had been changed but those rods were far better than the argos stuff even though the argos because <laughs> <Yeah. fun. laughs> well, you had a sea float in there and massive books yeah it's horrendous but the funny thing is um you know when you have chance conversations later in life i was chatting to darren cox now i didn't know at the time but leader um who he used to work for many years ago actually put them packs together and he says that he probably put together that pack that I started fishing with. So that's right, a nice bit of right. trivia for you. Though. And I bet they sold thousands and thousands of them, didn't they? Way more than well, Preston. Is it the best sold. selling rod, a John Wilson rod? Was it? Yeah, was I, I had one of them, Avon Quiver. Avon yeah. Quiver, yeah. That was my next step up, really. Like, because I'd done, you know, we, we did what we could with this little telescopic setup. But then obviously you get better. And remember Bennett's on the back of the uh, every magazine, Bennett's was on the back. Yeah. And they did combo kits. And um, we had the John Wilson Avon Quiver kit. So my dad bought me that and we went fishing with that. And then it sort of just progressed then, didn't it? Like started going club fishing. I did Leeds Juniors was a big junior club. I went into that. So was your dad into, into match fishing or was it I, just no, you fancy doing it? He was, he fished like most did at a young age. Um, my dad's into pigeon racing and rabbit shooting and everything. Right. He's what is a typical Northern guy, he has a go at ferreting, shooting. We used to go lamping with greyhounds. I know that's not a politically correct thing to do anymore, but we used to ferreting. Anything that was in the countryside, we used to have a go at, which I think is quite a nice upbringing to be fair. Um, yeah. And then, obviously, because I got more and more into fishing, I jack footballing, because I was playing a lot of football then, up until about the age of like 10, 11. Uh, jack that in, so we could go fishing more. Um, and then it was sort of, 
club fishing, Lee's juniors, um, just the usual steps, Rob, that we've all been through um, to get to where we are now, really. Um, nothing different. And I guess, like, moving it on a bit, like, getting into the trade, it was like, I've got Tom Scully to thank for this, really, like, everything. When I think, no, I have, when I think about it, because he was the one who got me blogging for that Fishing for Fun website. Like, without him, that would have never happened. So, thanks, Tom. Um, I think a lot of people, you've got to actually show an aptitude for doing it yourself as well. Oh. So, Well, at the time, Facebook wasn't such a big deal as it is now. YouTube wasn't such a big deal. This was 2006, 2005, 2006. Um, and an online blog was quite out there at the time. No one was really doing it. And then Tom asked me to do it on that Fishing for Fun website. And um, there's myself, Matt Godfrey, Stuart Lister and Tom. Um, and at, like I say, at the time, there was nobody doing that. And it was like, I mean, hell, he's like having a go here. And uh, it got quite popular. And then, and then obviously the DHP thing came up. And um, for those who don't know, David Old Publishing is where match fishing and pole fishing uh, are printed. And at the time, Tom was working there again. And he I remember the phone call. I remember the phone call. I remember exactly where I was when you rang me to tell me that you were yeah. um, going to DHP to work yeah. to DHP because at the time I was looking after the marketing side as a freelance on a freelance basis. Uh, some of the marketing aspects for Dynamite Baits, and I was also liaising with a lot of the anglers. And you were sponsored by Dynamite at the time. Yeah, because we used to have chats, didn't we? And we used to obviously talk then. Um, and you rang me up. And said, and I remember the exact place where I was, I was in a field walking the dog, and you said, Oh, I'm uh jacking my job, jacking my job in electrician, weren't you? Yes, but yeah. I'm jacking my job in, I'm going to work for uh, match fishing, was it? Match fishing, yeah, match start, fishing yeah. Edit editorial assistant. And um I was trying Dr. to talk Bobby. you out of it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah I was trying to talk you out of it, yeah. yeah. Because I said, Oh, if you're a sparker, keep going, mate. You've got a trade behind you. Maybe 10 years' time, you'll have a load of lads working for you. You can go fishing whenever you want. But you were just so keen. Mm. You just wanted to go fishing and work in fishing. Yeah, it was, it was that. Um, and I see a lot of it with young lads now. And it's, it's easy now. In fact, we'll go into this later, like how they mm. could progress into themselves. But, um, yeah, I was just, that's all I wanted to do. And I know that's, you know, everyone says that. But it's genuinely all I wanted to do. I didn't have girlfriends at the time. I wasn't, all I wanted to do was go fishing at that time. And then obviously the job and my dad, all my dad ever said to me, like working in the industry, in the, tra in the uh, building trade and stuff is fantastic. Um, you know, you'll always get a good living from that. But he said, the first opportunity you get to have a realistic, make a realistic living outside of it, take it. Cause it's, you know, it's hard on your body, isn't it? At the end of the day, my dad's knackered, yeah. he's 60 years old and he can barely get up in the morning. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and he was like, so as soon as I told him, obviously he was upset cause I was moving moving away that was another thing leaving home um but he was like go for it so that was it we went for it and uh up sticks literally moved down to rugby with tom and that was it oh. and that's another big thing isn't it because you know people who've been to uni and that probably go leave home but a lot of people don't leave home now do they no no you've got to be prepared to put the effort in and uh make a move maybe a lot of people now a lot of jobs require relocation don't they yes very few jobs that you can do sort of on a satellite basis just from home. Yeah. Um, Maybe this now might actually change that. Yeah, I think it does. I think it's re made people realise that you can do a lot of stuff from home, a bit more than you probably thought you could. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is that down to employers not trusting their staff properly, though? I think there's a little bit of, a bit of that. And there's obviously, it's a big move for an employer, isn't it, to, to allow the staff to work from home because yeah. obviously they invest a lot of money in offices and... Yeah. God knows what, and there's loads of fine print in there. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, and obviously this job at Preston, we'll talk about that in a bit, but that was, been, that was my, when I was negotiating the role, I wanted to work from home, and obviously that was a big deal for Preston because I've never had that before. So, oh. but you, need to be able to trust you, you need to be able to trust the person you're employing. If you you're need to be do. able to earn the trust as well. Yeah, you do. That's a big deal. Um, so yeah, so then we went through the, the magazines, um, Obviously worked with some great guys there, Dave Harrell, John Arthur, Alex Bones, Matt, Tom, obviously, Jake Fowles later on. So Dave, hang on a second. So all the time you were editorial assistant, weren't you? Editorial assistant, yeah. Um, and, to, and did you think at any time that you'd get 
to be the editor or did you actually put yourself forward? Because I don't think you necessarily thought, oh, no. I'm going to be the editor one day. No, I probably didn't because I was always a bit quieter than the others, if that makes sense. Mm. And I always felt like, you know, Tom was the next logical step after John and Alex obviously was a powerful character. And I never thought I'd really get a chance, but that was only, be, you know, because I could, I was like the, the engine behind the scenes, I suppose. Mm. Like did a lot of work and, and that was it. So obviously I got the chance to be editor in, was it 2017, 2016? Yeah, 2017. I remember you chatting to me and saying, um, almost sounding me out. And I thought, no, why aren't you <laughs> thinking about it for yourself? Because yeah. obviously it's nothing that I'd ever want to do. And but I could see the big picture outside of myself if you know what I mean I wanted the magazine to do well I yeah, wasn't sure I know. Yeah. I know obviously I want myself to do well but I obviously I was I was you know I love that magazine I still do mm. and yeah. uh obviously the fact that I could get maybe yourself um you know someone like that and try and take it in a different route would have been great but obviously I got the chance to do it it was it was a bit of a funny because Tom handed his notice in to go and set up Catch More Media and uh it was like one like Ten minutes later, Sean O'Driscoll, who was the MD at the time, called me into his office. Ten minutes later, I'm editor. And I was like, yeah. that's not how I expected this to go. Yeah, but it was the logical step, wasn't it? Well, I hope so. And I like to say I did yeah. a good job. But it's, yeah. Um, yeah, whirlwind journey, really. Right. So, obviously, match fishing. Mm. Good job on match fishing. Two years. I think you yeah. changed the mag as well. You put your own stamp on it, which yeah. obviously editors like to do. Yeah. And editors should do. Yeah. The phone call comes mm. probably after maybe a few phone calls from other companies. Yeah, well. I've, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously, other companies have maybe tried to get you to work work with them, mm. but the phone call comes from Preston. Were you straight in, or was it a? Or oh, not too sure about this. No, it was a, a not too sure about this because obviously, I don't take the job of editor lightly. You know, it's a it's a brilliant position to be in. Um, quite powerful of in the industry as you know Rob like you got a lot of clout with a lot of people yeah um, not that I ever let you know that was ever a big thing for me but you know if I ever needed kit you know people at the end of the phone to help me and no and I always thought you were the mm. you were the guy who was seen as, a, as a, like for the general guy who doesn't know what goes on behind the scenes at companies mm. um for the average angler you were seen as the top of the tree the opinion former of the whole industry. That's how I see the editor yeah, of matching. Editor of matching, yeah, and it's the same with um, you know other other titles as well. But um, so that wasn't an easy easy conversation. Um, obviously, the money was you know was good and and stuff like that. Um, so that wasn't an easy chat. But I just felt like I needed a new challenge, if anything. Um, mm -hmm. And the opportunity was there for, to work with Preston. And I, I, always, I had a lot. I've had a lot of inquiries over the years and I've been for a lot of chats with people over the years like you do and uh, I kind of always had my heart set on working for Preston I've probably given you that vibe over the years um, and there was so when that came I was really like um, yeah I kind of had my heart set on it deep down to be fair um, but yeah so I think did I, you think that you'd run out of ideas as well with match fishing because obviously editors don't last forever do they on the, no, on the magazine no and I didn't want to I didn't want to be the guy who hung around forever neither um, right, because it's. It, I think you owe it to the to the fans to have a fresh outlook on things. Yeah, sometimes. and so. also with magazines. What was the next step after being an editor at the HP? Yeah, that was that was a big thing for me. Because like, I, I don't think only it was ever necessarily get a next step. Yeah, that, that was that was that was as far as you could go. No, and, so and your people your, say just while well, I was on this subject before we move yeah. on, people say, "Oh, you move because the magazines are dying." And that couldn't have been further from the truth. From the minute I got there in 2010 to when I left last year, the sales of Mattress Magazine were literally on a level the whole time. They never barely dipped. They oh. barely lifted. They were a good, stable amount the whole time, which is fantastic, which just shows how loyal Mattress readers are, you know. And also it shows how... I think neglected match anglers are in the whole scheme of things in angling because they are your bread and butter anglers. They go rain or shine yeah. all throughout the winter. And I don't think enough emphasis is placed on match anglers as far as um, catering for them mm -hmm. on the wider picture. So I'm not too sure there's enough publications out there catering for match anglers. And I always wonder when a publication that's a bit more... Um, 
encompassing of all different styles. I'd like to see them give a bit more of coverage to match fishing yeah, because you just know that through throughout the 12 months, okay, you might have a lot of carp anglers read your publication in the summer months, but a lot of anglers pack up in the winter. And we but can your match see, anglers we can are still going. With this COVID-19, can't you? Match anglers are fanatical. Yeah. It's, it's like an addiction, isn't it? And yeah. I know fishing is an addiction to everybody. Yeah. I think match fishing, because it's got that competitive edge, it's like, like, it's like, it's huge for people, isn't it? Yeah, everyone's it's tweaking gross. gear and they want, they want, they want that fishing fix. And that's, and they're anglers that go very, on a, on a schedule, once a week, once a fortnight, mm -hmm. all the time. They don't pack it up, they just keep going and going keep every going, single yeah. week, every, yeah. every fortnight. Yeah. And they put that time aside, whereas I think a lot of anglers, there's no problem with that. I think a lot of occasional anglers probably pick up the kit, they look out the window, it's sunny, I might be fishing. There's a bit of that. Mm -hmm. And if your industry is relying on those sort of anglers, you could come unstuck. Yeah. So I think match anglers, I think you've just got to give them a bit more credit and cater for them a bit more. Yeah, it was, it was so obvious that was at DHP because we used to do like Total Course Fishing Magazine, which yeah. was kind of DHP slant on Improve Your Course Fishing. Um, and I know Improve Your Course Fishing has sold massive numbers for a lot of, lot of years. It was one of the first one to do that kind of thing. Um, but DHP could never get that sort of gen, general title to work. It just never worked. It was, it was always all right, but it, match fishing and total carp fishing just absolutely blew them out of the water with numbers yeah. wise. And it wasn't that it was a bad magazine. It was just, you need a niche, I think, to succeed yeah. in that kind of thing. I think you need a niche. Yeah, and do. I think match fishing is the perfect niche. Hmm. So, um, Preston then, let's yeah. talk about your day-to-day -day roles. Yeah, so, so obviously I, I started with that. and. My day-to-day -day role, I'm officially content creator. That's my job title. So I work closely with Adam Rumble, who's like my right-hand man. Uh, and he kind of looks after the background stuff, if you get what I mean. He's like, make sure that it's everything's just going. He deals with all the stuff. He's brilliant. Um, and then I get to do the nice things and go out filming people and uh, putting together all this great video content. So you're filming, editing, having a, uh, then having an input into all the other stuff. So yeah. maybe how to, maybe what advert you should run at what time. Yeah, to be fair, uh, Adam does all that. Um, okay. I, I don't get involved with any of that. He looks after all that. So yeah, I've um, okay. fell on my feet. <laughs> right. And, and, and in all this, we've but not that, talked about any fishing. No, but I, I've taught, this is, this is something that... Um, has come through by just being quite bold in the initial stages because I didn't want to do that. Um, and I kind of, that's what the, I, ad, the behind the scenes stuff that Adam's I, doing. Yeah, I didn't want to do that. And no. I was obviously getting interviewed and um, going through the negotiation sort of process. I kind of made it quite clear that my strengths were creating the stuff. And, and if you let me give me a, a, a free reign to do that, I'll do a good job for you. So that's, it's kind of how we went about it, and, and luckily Preston bought into it, and the guys there bought into it, and it's been—I think it's been good. Okay, right. So let's talk about your fishing because we've not even mentioned fishing. Yeah. Because your fishing, to me, has become very secondary. Yeah. To obviously, your career. Yeah. But I always used to think that you, I class. There's people out there who I class as like manufactured sort of anglers. And then there's your more natural anglers who maybe are a little bit messier, but they just read things better and just it just clicks with. I think you're a natural angler, but without maybe the big competitive drive that other yeah. people have got. Yeah. So you've still won big matches. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's important to have got where you've got? Yes and no. I think I've always had a bit of a, like the respect in within the industry and obviously amongst viewers and people who read the magazines and people who are now watching the videos and stuff which i think is very important to have credibility um but i think hard work trying to get the job would have paid off in the end but back before this it was fishing first mm. like up until getting my first job at dhp it was just about the fishing and then um then i had a wobble probably for the first few years of being at dhp where i, I didn't like going only because not i didn't like going fishing i just there was other things to do and it was the day to day oh god fishing again then i sort of got out of that and i've tried to now find a balance although it's not perfect i think it's it, it suits me at the moment because obviously i've got a little little one that i want to bring up right and uh, sort of balance all that as well so i think it's so important to understand 
that if you gag in to get a job in the fishing game, it's not going to be... going to have an impact. It's, it's going to have a massive impact on what your, what your own personal fishing is, unless you can... Unless you're absolutely fanatical, when in which case I still think if your candle's burning that fast, it's going to run out sooner or later. Yeah. So I still think even if you're absolutely fanatical, you're going to run out of steam sooner or later. So it's important to understand that. It is massive. It's a big step, that is. Um, and people will be like, oh, what a load of rubbish. She just doesn't like going. It's not that at all. It's, um, I've seen it with so many people who come into the trade and then you just see it, that, that fire's going out. And unfortunately, I've managed to keep mine going. But, and I'll tell you how Matt and people like that managed to do it. I'm not sure because, to be fair to Matt and um, this Frankie, is Matt Goffrey, Matt Goffrey, Frankie, Tom, and I don't know whether it's because, um, probably the home life's a little bit different. And obviously, Tom doesn't have a partner. He might do actually. Now. I don't know. But whether that's a big factor, I'm not sure. But they just really keep going. And fair play to them. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I think they're young and keen. We'll see what they're like in maybe 10 years' time. And they're, they're doing, you know, they're really young and keen. Yeah. But 10 years' time with a family it might be mm. difficult for everybody, that is. Yeah, but I think it's... A, I hate to drag this into it, but it's a financial thing as well because I've obviously got a mortgage and I've got to be careful and I've got to support my family and there's things we want to do as a family. And I, I have to be, you know, I have to think about what I'm spending my money on and... Yeah. If I just go and spaff all my money on fishing, obviously the bills don't get paid. So I know I don't like bringing that into it, but you've got to consider all these things if you do want to get into fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of uh, relationships have <laughs> fell apart because of fishing, and rightly or wrongly. And let's be fair, it's not the highest paid industry, neither. No, it isn't. So the downsides to it, let's talk about the downsides to fishing. The downsides to fishing is there's not a load and load of jobs out there. And no. if you want to do a similar sort of job to what you're doing. You're going to what get I will it. say though, every one of my mates that I've grown up with who put their mind to it, have all ended up getting a job in it. So yeah, I suppose, yeah, they have. If you, if you keep knocking on the door, found a way it, to do it. Like even like Lee Kerry, obviously it's a different way he's gone about it. He's done it through yeah. fishing, but he's earned a living out of fishing. Yeah. And every one of my close friends who's actually wanted to do it and put their mind to it have got a job. So there's hope for everybody. If, they, if that's the route they want to say. Yeah. I think, I think there is. Um, we keep hearing about the trade being in a bit of a doom and gloom period, but I'm not too sure about that. I think no, some, some other companies, well, a lot of companies are still doing well. Their turnovers are up every year like, and they're still obviously selling fishing kits. So we all know how important marketing is to um, companies. So if you want to get in that side of, that side of the game, I think there's roles there. However, you're going to get paid a hell of a lot more in another industry doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be competing against more people, I guess, because what is there in fishing? Looking, looking for these sort of marketing jobs. You know when, you, when people advertise for marketing, um, marketing assistants or marketing um, managers, there's not many people out there who can do the job, is there? Not many at all. And um, it's... It's, it's difficult because I've been in this situation when I, you know, at the last Matrician magazine, because they obviously wanted me to take a keen interest in getting the next editor. And uh, the pool was small. And actually thinking outside the box and getting Dan in was actually a good move because he's, he's given it a fresh, um, a fresh outlook. And he's been really good, actually, Dan has. But that was only a, that was a bit of a thinking outside the box moment. Mm. Um, yeah. There aren't many people when you actually right. think about it. No, there isn't. There isn't. I suppose it's probably because because fishing is a very, I want to say, working class sport, but I don't think that's the right term. I think a lot of tradesmen are involved in fishing, or mm. or the people that do go fishing tend not to be, you know, office bound people. I don't. I don't think no, there's I think loads and loads of office bound people doing I fishing. It is. And I think a lot of people don't. A bit, probably a bit shy and a bit nervous as well about getting yeah. trying to get involved. So yeah, so the, the, the negatives are there's not that many negatives if we're honest. Oh. Um, like I love what I do, I have a great life because of it. So, but there, you know, there are a few little hurdles that you got to get over. But if you are mad for it, you can do it. Yeah. Um, all I need to get across to people though is. The fact of the fishing versus work life is not what people expect. No. So if you want to get into fishing, 
because you absolutely love fishing. You want to go fishing. You see these guys, uh, maybe you see people like me or, you know, Lee or something like that, and he goes fishing every day of the week. I had a chap messing with me this morning. You must go fishing 250, 300 times a year. <laughs> and that was his, that was his question. Yeah, yeah. And it was, I had to reply to him and say, no, I go fishing less now than I ever used to. Mm. And two, I probably fish one match a week, maybe two um, during the summer months. But then the rest of the time, if I go fishing, it's for a magazine feature or for filming. filming. Um, yeah. So you're not really, you're on the bank, which is great. Uh, but the, you're not, not the same really, though, is it? It's not the same. It's not the same it's as fishing. Same. fishing. And obviously you, you know, take great pride in being a good dad and that, and you're trying to do your thing there as well. So that takes up a lot of your time and it's, it, it's difficult, isn't it? It's the, it's the balance. So the reason I like what I do now, which is basically go fishing, uh, some coaching, quite a bit of media work as well. Um, so I'm trying to sp spread it all over. So the fishing side to me is important. I need to, I need to really concentrate on my back. fishing side. I, don't, I wouldn't really want to take my eyes off, off that side of the sport because that's the reason I got into, yeah. I got into fishing because I love fishing, not because I wanted a job in fishing. That's just come about because of um, how, how things have felt. But I would never want to lose that side. And I think a lot of people... <clears throat> I just go and fishing to get that job in fishing or to get that sponsorship. And I just think that's the wrong, the wrong way of going about it. That's when you do lose the love, love for the sport. Um, but what it does for me is it offers me a bit more time with my family. And because you can do certain things from home, you know, i.e. editing something or writing magazine articles, or you might not have to turn up um, at a specific time for work every day, clock in and clock out. You don't have to do that sort of thing you can manipulate your fishing life a little bit more around your family. So that's what, that's the benefits for me. So, yeah, so you obviously you... see it from a different perspective from me. Yeah. Um, but if let's go, let's move on then. Let's move on. If someone has got that burning desire to get into it, working in it or a fully sponsored angler, because there's only a handful of fully sponsored anglers like, and I class that as people getting paid to do it. Yeah. Um, what should they do? I think they've got to be, first of all, they've you got do to it be... from the angler side and I'll do it from, the, from my side. Well, I think we're going to be talking off the same hymn sheet because obviously I've not quite been in your shoes, but almost yeah. I, I see, yeah, I've seen, seen it, it from your side. I've, I've, yeah. I've dealt with that side. So for me and for a person to feel comfortable doing it for longevity, First of all, they've got to go out fishing. They've got to be reasonably competitive when they go fishing. So the fact that they're competitive and they're winning things and building up their CV, going fishing, being approachable on the bank, being a nice person to talk to, that is all adding to the, to the pot. Because what you need to be is an influencer because a, a company is not going to pick you up as a sponsored angler if you're not going to be able to influence people to, as crudely as it sounds, buy that company's product. So you need to be an approachable person. You need to have some results behind you. You need to love your fish. You need to come across great. Um, so you're a great guy is Andy May, someone like that. He's absolutely fantastic at this sort of thing. Really approachable, created his own little brand. Perfect. He's done a perfect Got his job. results. So no one questions his angling ability. So when he does say something, um, you know, people will think, that's, I, I, I believe and trust Andy, I'm going to go and buy that bait or I'm going to go and buy that pole. Or, because he comes across as that really nice person. But Andy built that up from being a really, really good angler. Won fishing so first. many things. Won so many things. Fishing came first. Um. Then a bonus is being able to write. That's what I sort of formulated my um, initial plans on, being able to write. Because obviously mm -hmm. when I was rising up, magazine articles were massive. So I, the first thing I did, after thinking my second or third magazine article, is I said to the photographer I was working with at the time, I'll write, he said to me, if you do want to write the next one, I said, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll write the next one. And so I just started writing. Obviously the first few aren't, aren't amazing, but then as you get better, you get better. The editor doesn't even, the editor of the magazine or the, the media guy who's putting everything together, he hardly has to touch the work, which is obviously saving them a massive amount of time. And everyone wants the text and the feature to come from that first person because mm -hmm. then you get the, more, the most information. So being able to write is a bonus. 
being good in front of camera now is massive. Um, so obviously learning that sort of trait, maybe even having some editing skills yourself to do that sort of thing is massive because that's the way that fishing's going. But not upsetting people is, is huge. <laughs> and also just knocking on the door and keeping going and just putting yourself in the right places mm. without causing a nuisance of yourself. And I think there's a lot of young, keen anglers who are capable of all that. They've just got to put all the pieces together and maybe not expect the world for mm -hmm. offering very little. There's a lot of guys who have won a few matches, you know, some local club matches maybe, or some local smaller opens, and all of a sudden, maybe a, a, an older angler will say to them, oh, you'd be good, you, you could get sponsored one day. And all of a sudden, that sows the season ahead, and they're all out then to get sponsored, and they feel like maybe the world owes them something. When it doesn't, you've got to add it all together. You've got to build up so much credential, so many credentials over time to become that influencer and to get those other anglers in the industry to buy into you because you're mm. selling the products at the end of the day. And yeah. you've got to also remember that the average age of anglers is sort of 40 to 60. So it's going to be very hard for a young angler, maybe a 25 year old early 20s, maybe even late 20s, it's going to be very hard for one of those guys to persuade a 40 to 60-year-old to buy a product or and to have opinions, right? Them. Because a 40-year-old or a 60-year-old bloke, he doesn't want to listen to a 20-year-old guy. He, he doesn't. So he has to be something very special to be able to, you know, influence those people. Yeah, I think, um, I think at the minute, everybody's Facebook mad. And I think it's time for people, if you are serious about this and you want to make yourself stand out, find yourself a bit of a platform that's a bit, gives yourself that niche that we mentioned earlier. Um, at the time for me, it was blogging on that Fishing for Fun website because nobody was really doing it. Um, obviously blogging's a bit old hat now, but set yourself a YouTube up or build an Instagram and do your Instagram lives and all that sort of stuff. Just be a little bit different because you know what it's like on a Saturday night Facebook, Facebook, well, it's just rubbish, isn't it? Yeah. Be bold, do something a little bit different that makes you stand out from the crowd because fishing comes first, but on a very close second, being good at media will get you a long way in being a sponsored angler. All of the top guys, yourself, Dez, Steve Ringer, Lee, have all been able to write, they've all been able to talk in front of the camera and being comfortable from day one doing that is massive, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I think that is the streak. Because let's get it right. I, without blowing my own trumpet, I've won a hell of a lot of things. Yeah. But maybe not seen in that same class as Des or Steve Ringer. But my media skills mm. have got me catch to you go, catch you going really well. To be able to do what I'm doing now. So um, the media side had to be a little bit better than those guys. You know, I don't imagine they're editing videos or filming videos. Um, but that's the extra string to my bow. Yeah. So that's the other thing as well. It's not all about being a clone of everybody else and just trying to be better. So right. as Joe says, sitting on Facebook and having a really active Facebook or trying to build your Facebook um, page, it's going to get you somewhere, but it's not going to cut it really with the big guys. What you need to do is offer something mm -hmm. unique. So if you can offer a different platform that you're controlling or if you can offer a different way that you fish or... Get your info across. Even hard backs to... Jan Porto, the man in red, he was different. Yeah. You know, you just got to be a little bit different and put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, and that is where, obviously, you make, you, you make your inroads into, into the fishing industry. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, going back to the Facebook thing as well, and it's something you was on about, like, with it being approachable and stuff. Oh, just remember that what you post on that doesn't go away. So think about what you're posting. Don't get into stupid arguments with people and doing all that stuff that makes people think, oh, I don't really like him. Just post what you think's right. Post what you think's timely. Post what you think's helpful to people and, and just leave. Yeah. <laughs> don't get stuck in these little niggly arguments because I, me as someone looking to sponsor people, I hate it because I just think, oh, that's a guy that could cause me issues down the line. Um, if I sponsor him, what happens is in a year it blows up on Facebook or this gets dragged out the closet and it causes me problems um, or my boss's problems. You know what I mean? So it's like, think about it. 
Because yeah. I see low-end of people who I think, he's a brilliant angler in. I'd love to sponsor him. But then I look at the background and you, oh. <laughs> Yeah, but that maybe, to- talks to you, that maybe tells you about how that person is as a, as a person as well. That's what, exactly. So yeah. that Facebook is a representation of the, per- is the, per- of the person. So yeah. you, can't, you can't back someone who is a exactly. dickhead on Facebook. You, exactly. you, just, you just can't. Because although Facebook... Whether it's massively important to media huge, or not, huge. Is, it's the number you know, one. It's it, it's it's got to be um, put across in the right way. You can't just have some dickhead spouting his political views one minute. No, and because his views and about is, another angler a second. Then he's slating another company's products. Then you just think, oh, what is this yeah. guy about? You can't yeah, be, you can't act like that. And it becomes it's the same sort of thing as when we do a video. And you get that one thumbs down and you think, oh, that's ruined it for me, that. <laughs> he, this guy who we're on about on Facebook, whoever it is, could post a million positive things and you think he's perfect for me, sponsored. But then he could post one thing that gets you go and he, that sticks in there, doesn't it? And you're like, yeah. oh, I'm a bit wary of him. So just think about it, guys. You know, like, use it as the tool it's meant to be. Make it a nice place. Make it a nice place. Yeah, He'd be it. a nice guy. That's the yeah. bottom of it. Yeah. I'd but, like to think but, we are. My um my Facebook, I've, as you know, I've deleted loads of people. Um, I've got a fishing page, which I don't call it fishing. I just don't like the tag at the end of fishing. <laughs> I just don't like it. So <laughs> I've knocked that off. I've got my page that's dedicated for fishing stuff. But obviously to host a page, you have to have a personal page. Mm. And that's how obviously a lot of people start. So you've got your personal page and so almost straight away, it just fills up to sort of like what 5,000 is your limit. So it fills up to that sort of thing. And... Every, every time I see something that I just think, oh, I don't want to deal with this, or someone that generally spouts crap, I just delete them straight away off, that, off their uh, personal page because that's what I see, and I don't want to be seeing any negativity on that. I just want, I want my world to be filled with positivity <laughs> all the time, and yeah. that's how I want my world to be. And that, yeah. the way my phone or my Facebook page is, is that's the only that's one of the few things I can control at the minute, I, yeah. and I can control that. So I just see positive, happy people, people who don't argue with people. You know, if I want to see those, I'll get the screenshots. Someone will send me the screen, <laughs> screenshots yeah, yeah. If, they so, want, if they want me to see that sort of thing. To summarize, then, if you're wanting to get in the fishing trade, you really should be thinking about videos, video editing, setting up YouTube channels, gaining yourself a bit of momentum in that way. And that would, that's a great start for yeah. me looking for people or whoever looking for people. Yeah. If you're an angler and you're wanting to get sponsored, don't be a dickhead. Yeah. Fundamentally, don't be a dickhead. Make your fishing do the talking. Find yourself a platform that works for you. I yes, think that's-, that's it. Yeah, but as, a, as an angler, I think find a platform that works for you, but please don't neglect your fishing. You mm. see, see so many people who, and there's loads of good anglers out there, Joe, isn't there? There's loads of loads. good, keen anglers out there. And not all of them can have a massive deal. They've got to offer something just slightly unique, some slightly different skill sets. So your skill sets obviously come down to your filming and editing and mm-hmm. seeing that ideal shot and that ideal moment where you put a cut away in and the way you edit things and the, you know you can see that perfectly. Whereas a lot of my skill set comes down to maybe a bit of business guidance or knowing the industry a little bit better. Plus there's the media side with the filming, the editing the writing, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but fundamentally, I, if, I, if I felt that my angling was suffering because of all that, so I'd again. probably pack it all in and go and get another job, you know, yeah. because I, the fishing to me is important. Yeah. Um, and I need the fit. I, I started fishing just like you, going fishing with my dad, really basic with no illusions of getting anywhere in the fishing game. I just did it because I enjoyed doing it. And I would never want to lose that enjoyment. Mm-hmm. I think a lot. I think some people have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's pretty uh, sums it up. But you know, if you if you do want to get into the fishing industry and you're interested in the media sort of role, just send. I'm always willing to give my opinion on things. Like send me it, email me or face, find me on Facebook. Send me a video that you've done. Give me something to you know to have a comment on, and I'll try and help people if I can. Um, it might be rubbish, and I'll tell you. <laughs> But it might be brilliant and you might be the next guy sitting in my chair doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So the opportunities are there for people who want to do it. I'd say that.
Superb. Right. Are we ending it there? I think so. Is that, a, is that a good enough answer for everybody, is it? I think so. I We've think not so. covered really sponsored, non-sponsored anglers, have we? No. What, what's your game, what do you think on that? I think it's a sticky subject, I do. I think it's, I think it's a bit of a soundbite subject as well that people use to get people worked up. So <laughs> there's a lot of the old trade-sponsored anglers, and then there's, you've got your proper sponsored anglers. Oh, do we even go into that? We'll go into that another time, maybe, shall I we? Think so. I think that's a, that's a totally different subject, isn't it? Yeah. Talk about, I was going to tell you about my run this morning. Have you been for a run? Yeah, I've been for a run. I woke up this morning, I thought, I'm going for a run. Is that what took the rest of your air off? No, last night I just thought, <laughs> I'm going to do it. No, I think it's nice. Is that a grade one, is it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Just got the shaver on it. Looks, well, I could say, I look okay from the front, but then I think I look a bit like an alien from the side. But... <laughs> I'm happy enough with it. Yeah, I went for a run. I made a mile before I had yeah. to stop. Yeah. <laughs> a mile. Oh, so out of shape, Joe. So yeah. yeah. I'm just eating horrendous food all the time. What were you on last night? Last night? Well, last night created a perfect storm in my stomach. <laughs> right? <laughs> and we've had um, like a curry, cooked a curry with a load of uh, lentils. No rice, just a, like lentils and um, chicken, spicy chicken. And whatever I'd had earlier in the day, plus that curry, oh, my ass <laughs> absolutely stank, you know. Absolutely stank. You cannot believe it. it I, went, I, um, I woke up middle of the night because our youngest, uh, Monty, was uh, crying. So I had to go, go and sort him out. And I smelt the room. It absolutely stink, stank. Oh, it was, it was horrendous, the smell. Well, I've obviously been fighting all night. It was horrendous. I've gone in to see my youngest put him to bed, you know, five minutes, go, sleep, 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 come back in. Sally's there. She's rough, rustled in the, per, in the drawer. She's got a perfume. <laughs> she's, spraying, <laughs> she's spraying perfume around the room because it stank that much. Oh, it was horrendous. So we're just eating crap all the yeah, time. All the time. Never I mean, we're actually, the dinners at night aren't too bad, but it's, you know, a bag of crisps, in it. chocolate. And obviously we've still got a load of Easter egg left that we're just eating all the time. Yeah. Whenever the kids go to bed, that's like, right, let's get an Easter egg out. <laughs> just eat their Easter eggs. <laughs> just, so a mile is my first run today. I'm going to see if I can do a little bit more. What think, about the alcohol consumption? How's no, that? not too bad. No, I'm having a, a, a couple of beers. That's it. Only little bottles, a couple of beers. Help me sleep. Because let's get it right. We're not exactly exerting ourselves. <laughs> <that. So, laughs> I'm doing a patio at home. So I've been digging the base out all week. Right. on the side and the, I get done at about half seven on the night and that first beer crack it open oh my god is it nice it just slides down yeah it just slides down so yeah, yeah I'm I'm on, I'm on, I've got some little bottles of Stella that I'm drinking at the minute but until I run out so I'm... when we're going fishing Rob <sighs> I don't know that, feel... let's just let's just hang back yesterday there was that little snippet of a newspaper wasn't there that people were there getting. was yeah a lot of people uh, sending that round i've had phil ring a message of me this morning as well mr positive and i love phil's positivity yeah all little snippets from all over europe talking about their policies different uh, mm -hmm. policies from all over europe and every single one he sends me he's never going to send me a negative one because phil just wouldn't but he's sending, he's sending me um yes fishing is okay in italy from may whatever it is the 7th or the 11th or something mm -hmm. like that Belgium, they will, re they will relax their fishing. And it's just messages from people who are anglers in those countries. So you can't take them as gospel. No. Everyone's talking about it now. Everyone's talking about the next step, what, re what measures are going to be to relax everything. So well, it's interesting. maybe it's not far away. No, and um, I was speaking to my friend Jan in Belgium yesterday who works for Preston. And I had a meeting with him yesterday. And he was telling me the rod license sales have gone through the roof in Holland. Because fishing's right. allowed in Holland, there's no lockdown. So they're traveling over, are they? No, no, not, not that. People are seeing it as an opportunity, a great chance to be outside. So families are taking up fishing, which is great okay. to see. Um, uh, yeah, so if fishing becomes one of the few pastimes that you can do, we could see it. We could see a bit of a couldn't we? Yeah, so hopefully, you know, if it is, it is that way, it might be dads and lads mm. trying to get out or yeah. giving it a go for the first time. So let's hope so. That'd be nice. Mm. That'd be yeah, nice. let's hope so. Let's ever. hope so. What, when do you think? Do you think it's close? Do you think on this next... So obviously we're talking now um, late April. you think on this next sort of like assessment of the dates, do you think they're going to relax things and say, look, 
go out, do certain things. Because let's get right, more and more people are going to work now. More and more yep. people are going yeah, to work. B&Q opened, isn't it, this week? B&Q's opened. Yeah. I think more and more shops are going to open in that sort of style with social distancing measures. Yeah. Do you, can you see us getting out there in maybe two weeks' time? I think two weeks' time might be a bit, bit tight, but I, I'll tell you what, I'm more positive about it now than I was a few days mm. ago. Yeah, and I'm I don't the know same. And I think it's just the, the perception, maybe. I don't know if anything's even changed. Mm. But, um, but yeah, I actually feel positive about it at the moment. I noticed a fishery, um, again on Facebook, announced that we're going to let people <laughs> through the gates. Um, Mixed reviews that got, didn't it? Oh, it got absolutely slated, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, the odd person did support it, saying, well, if we can go, why, why can't we go fishing? But my word, it got some yeah. hammer that place did. Um, yeah. And they were, they were obviously trying the best. They're saying, look, you can only have two people on a lake or something like that. Um, but we're going to open the gates. If you want to come fishing, come fishing. But they got some hammer. And maybe it is a bit too early to start doing stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. No, it just shows what the public perception is of that sort of thing. Just I think we've got a chance though, in two or three weeks' time of getting mm -hmm. out pleasure fishing. I, mean, we're, I think matches are way off yet, just yeah. because of the public gathering thing. But even if we can get out pleasure fishing, that would be great for everybody, wouldn't it? Yeah, it will, yeah. Right, so let me talk to you about the technical side because I'm the tech wizard. You are the tech office. wizard, you are. The podcast of these um, videos is available on Apple, iTunes. Is it? Yeah. Big in the and game. And also uh, Google Podcasts. Yeah. So anyone that wants to find the, this and run it as a podcast, which I think is a fantastic idea, you take the dog for a walk, put it in your car, um, go for a run, listen to me and Joe rabbit on about all things fishing. You can search for it on Google, search for it on um, your Apple um, podcasts and it'll be there and there'll be loads of different episodes. And as, as we've mentioned, we've had some pretty good guests. We've got some good guests lined up as well, haven't we? Yeah, I think that's the, it's nice that is. Um, you know, if we could do every other one with a guest, I think that'd be really good. Yeah, get some uh, different opinions on what's happening. And I don't think it necessarily has to be someone who's just match angler, match angler, match angler. Someone like Rob Hughes has got, who's got an opinion on the whole industry. I think that's interesting. I think yeah. it gives people a little bit more to chew on. Yeah. And something that they're maybe not used to listening to as well. Yeah, I hope, I hope people enjoyed the Rob Hughes one because um, he did divide opinion last week on Facebook, didn't he, with his live? And, <laughs> he certainly uh, <laughs> did. Well, I think what happened was Rob did a um, sort of like a preliminary live announced that it was going to go live later with some great news about fishing. Oh, and everyone's desperate jumped. for that golden bit of news. Yeah, everyone's jumped on that as if to say, Rob Hughes is going to tell us we're going to go fishing, which that wasn't the case. Um, it was Hughes, never going to be the case. It was never going to be the case. If Rob Hughes, as, as well-informed as Rob is, and as much of an Anglian, Anglian ambassador that Rob is, it's not going to be an angler that announces you can go fishing, that we can go fishing. It's going to be government bigger guidelines. It's going to be much bigger than that. So whoever thought Rob was going to announce that we could go fishing was totally off the mark. Mm. And what Rob's do then done is obviously during the live that everyone's tuned in on because they're hoping that he's going to announce to go fishing, he gave some great information about clubs and what's going on. It wasn't that bit that people wanted. It wasn't that bit that people wanted. It wasn't the green no, side. No, everyone's got the ump with him. Yeah. <laughs> and Just again... Saying. Again, negativity, but I think it, there was no real need for the negative side of it. I think it probably just got blew out of proportion. And once, once the odd person starts uh, yeah. having a go, everyone else starts having a go. Yeah, but he's got, every, Rob's got the best interest of fishing at heart, I will say that. Yeah, there's a, I'm glad he's fighting our corner because he articulates well and he sees it from a lot of different sides. Which yes, is good. he does. He does. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully we'll have some good news. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so everybody subscribe. What, what days are we going to try and get these out? So Fridays, Tuesdays and Fridays, I think. Tuesdays and Fridays, they're the days. They're the so days. Everyone mm -hmm. will have some fresh fishing chat. Uh, chat on Tuesdays and Fridays. That is the plan. Mm, but don't forget to subscribe, everyone. Yeah. Don't forget to download it if you're on a podcast platform. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And until next time. Tight lines. <laughs> Thumbs up, tight lines. See you later. <laughs>